Hey guys, what's up? Eddie Alho here with KissAnalog.com. Today's exciting. We're gonna, I've got some notes in here in my Kiss Analog notebook. <laughs> and you can get yours. Links below. No, uh, so what we're gonna do today is we're gonna actually start the power supply design. So we're doing a power supply design for John Audio Tech. It's a collaboration that I have with him on his amplifier design. And we're gonna design a power supply. So we're gonna design a active power factor correction circuit before our conversion for our isolation for our plus and minus voltages. Last video, we figured out how much power we need. I think we're gonna shoot for 400 watts. So 400 watts at the output of the power supply. So that means the input needs a little bit more because of efficiency. We're gonna go over the numbers in just a minute, okay? What I wanna do is just show you what we're gonna design. We're gonna start with the inductor. Now the magnetics, you know, we refer to the inductors and transformers, things with the ferrite or whatever kind of cores you use. Uh, a lot of us just refer to that as magnetics, okay? So the magnetics are the heart of the power supply. And sometimes they might be the most challenging thing to get just right, okay? So here's my board. Hopefully there's no reflections. Um, okay, basic circuit of the active power factor correction so it's essentially a boost converter and it works on the pulsating DC I've kind of got a bunch of stuff going on here but I've got the blue waveforms here is the 60 Hertz or 50 Hertz depending on what country you're from and this power supply will work for either one we're gonna do a universal input no switching a switch from you know 120 to 240 or anything like that it's just gonna automatically work for wherever you happen to be, 50 or 60 hertz. Uh, basically from 85 volts up to 264 or 265, whatever. So it'll cover the range, okay? And all right, so here we go. We got the voltage waveform, 50, 60 hertz. That's the voltage. Current that normally happens is when, you know, in the rectifier, when you're charging that big old bulk capacitor out here, you're getting this huge spike, huge spike. So what a lot of people think of as a linear power supply is really a low frequency switcher. It's a 60 hertz or 50 hertz switching power supply. It's actually 120 hertz or 100 hertz because you know this is a positive part of the sine wave and this is a negative sine that's flipped over because of the, the bridge rectifier. All right, so that's out there. And you haven't missed anything. This we're just starting the design. The actual design is starting, you know, you know, now as far as design components. So the guy in blue, the boost inductor, we're gonna design that today. Okay, we're gonna come up with the value and then we'll select it in the next video. So once we have the inductor designed, then it's a lot easier to come up with the the value for all these or or select the components for the rest of these parts. Okay. But this is, like I say, the heart of the thing. Now, what I've shown here, what you're looking at is this little, you know, sorry about the drawing, but I'm trying to show this uh, kind of triangular wave shape, and that's what the current looks like. So instead of a normal power supply where you have a bridge rectifier just feeding a big old bulk capacitor without the stuff in between it, well, what you get is that big old spike when the voltage at the rectifier is bigger than the capacitor that it charges the cap charges the cap low frequency switching okay diodes are commutating on and off so low frequency switching in this case we still have the low frequency switching kind of uh, what we're doing is the voltage is getting squared up I'll put on the positive side of the our voltage line here so we're getting positive voltage bumps okay pulsating DC I mean that's what they teach you back in school right pulsating DC hmm, sounds like a switching power supply so but instead of just getting one big old spike of current to charge a cap what we're gonna do is this this guy here is the magic he's gonna switch much faster and go to a high frequency so that we don't have to use a gigantic you know transformer to drop the voltage or boost the voltage step it up step down or whatever so this guy here is going to allow us to take little bit of current chunks all around the wave shape. That's why the current is going to look sinusoidal. But it does kind of look like this. It has that ripple on it. So 
and then we smoothed it off and but the other advantage of that besides not having a big old current spike is also that the current is lined up with the voltage so the phase shift is very very minimal we're talking you know maybe a couple percent tile out instead of like the other ones where maybe it's 60 percent okay where the current the main current 60 hertz is out of phase with your voltage so you don't get the current and the voltage maximums happening at the same time what you end up with is what they call VA what you got it looks like one amp RMS 120 volts RMS it looks like 120 VA but you're only getting say 70 watts out of that actual power in this case our power and our VA are very close. Like I said, one or two percent tile out. Closer to one, probably. Uh, so, yeah. And there's different kinds of controllers we've talked about before where if this guy here fully charged up and fully drained, then instead of small triangular wave shapes, the triangle wave shapes would come down and touch this line. And that's the critical conduction mode, okay? And then there's the discontinuous where he actually runs out of current, waits for a while until the next pulse comes along. So not only does it come down here and touch, but there's a little delay before the next triangle happens. In this case, we're getting a whole bunch of little triangles because we're going to have a larger inductor. We have more inductance, so that means the inductor is bigger. This is a disadvantage, but the advantage is we get a lot less ripple current, okay? All right, so let's just say it's operating to 60 kilohertz. This guy's switching on and off at 60 kilohertz. That's a thousand times faster than 60 hertz. So you'd get, you know, and now we got two bumps in here. So let's just say that you get with a thousand of these triangles. And I, I'm only showing, I don't even know what I got, 30 in there. But you'd have a thousand of, you know. So on a, an oscilloscope, this thing just looks like fuzz because there's so many spikes so close together, it just like looks like fuzz until you zoom in and then you'd see something like that, okay? All right, so there we go. And then, you know, so just quickly to go over the boost, this guy switches on, he charges current up, so it ramps up, and then he turns off and he ramps down. And so when he turns off, then the current that ramped up is now ramping down through the diode into the capacitor. So that's when, when you see these downward angles, that's the current that's dumping into the capacitor. So now we're charging the capacitor a thousand times per cycle more or faster than we did at 60 hertz. So instead of getting one big old spike, divide that up into a thousand times and spread it from here to here. There you go, that's the advantage, okay? And let's go ahead and look at the math, okay? All right, guys, let me show you the what I got from my notebook, okay? Doing a little math. Okay, so this is what I came up with, and check my math, let me know if I got it right. So the VN, our specs, you know, for this power supply, we want to operate from 85 volts RMS uh, to 265, so, um, that ought to cover us and from 50 to 60 hertz, right? So that ought to cover us for both US and over in Europe, right? And then uh, the power out is 400 watts. So therefore, the power in is 400 watts divided by our efficiency. And let's just say we're shooting for 95%. We should get better than that, but let's just say it's 95. So 421 watts. That's what we're going to have at the input. It actually might be a little bit higher because now that I think about it, I'm kind of forgetting the second stage, the efficiency of that. But then again, this is pretty low, so I think we're okay. We'll shoot for something, you know, something, some percentage above this, okay? When we get in the current limit, that's when that'll come in important, okay? So, all right, so here we are. Um, if we calculate the IN max, it'll be the power N, which is this 421, Divided by the VRMS min, which is this, okay? And that gives us right about 5 amps RMS at the input, okay?
Okay. So we we calculate the inductor for the worst case, uh, and then it should work for all the other cases. Now, the L boost equation for this active power factor correction inductor is this long equation. It's really not that long. I just kind of drew it and made it <laughs> look long. But it's the square root of 2 of VRMS min. So it's the minimum input, but it's the DC value. So it's the peak value of that waveform, which is the square root of uh, 2 of that, right? So now that's divided by the percentage of ripple current. That little triangle that's riding on top of the wave shape is the percentage of that uh, ripple current that we want. Okay, so we take this value, it's IN max, square root of 2 of that to find the peak value of that. And then we say we're going to do 40% ripple, okay? That's kind of an optimal value for an inductor, 40% for, for this. Um, you can go less, but anyway, we're, we're going to just use 40% for this. We'll talk about that in another video, kind of show some examples. And then that's multiplied by the frequency, all right? And then that's times this thing in the parentheses, and that's 1 minus this stuff okay so it's square root of two vr vrms minimum so the the peak of the input same voltage here so it's right here it's and divided by v out okay and you know what we're going to shoot for 400 volts i didn't write that here yeah i should wrote the output voltage that's that's a big miss <laughs> uh the output voltage we're going to shoot for 400 volts okay so yeah, it's 1 minus input voltage divided by output voltage, basically. So, uh, put that in, and it comes out to 240 microhenries. All right, let me know if your math comes out the same way. So, there we go. Um, looks like we need 240 microhenries. And we need an inductor that can handle this, like RMS current, but peak currents of this plus half of the uh, 40%. So, yeah, we'll select the inductor next video where I'll kind of go further into this, okay? We'll, we'll come up with the uh, current that the inductor has to handle, uh, but you kind of get an idea here. If this is five amps, 40% of that is two amps, so it's one amp, so it's basically six amps peak that it has to handle, five amps RMS, okay? So that's the current it has to handle without getting too hot. And uh, this is the inductance we want, 240 microhenry. So we might if we might be able to find, be lucky and find something off the shelf that would be close to this value. So we'll have to take a look. Next video, we'll do that, okay? All right, guys, hope that made sense. And next video, we will select the inductor. We'll kind of go over the particulars and how to look for the inductor and we'll see if we can find one off the shelf so that way you can kind of see how I search for an inductor and look at all the parameters that are important okay so we'll do that next video and we'll probably select that diode too, that boost diode that'll be pretty easy now that we know what the current going to the inductor is it'll be pretty easy to select that diode and we're gonna select a pretty cool diode I think we're gonna get a sick diode and I'll explain why uh, okay, that'd be pretty cool. Hey, I want to thank everybody for watching. Two big thumbs up for my Patreons. Really appreciate you guys. You become a Patreon. There's a link down below. That'd be awesome. Uh, you can also support the channel by just giving the like. Uh, liking the video really does help a lot. Uh, and also subscribe. If you haven't subscribed, I notice a lot of people I, I see that, you know, we talk, talk a lot at least in the comment section that still haven't subscribed and I just hit 18,000 that was awesome but I want to hit 20,000 I want to grow this channel so I can spend more time doing videos so that'd be really sweet uh, so yeah subscribe that helps and also there's a new um, a new button down below next to the thumbs up the like button uh, it's a I think it's a thank you or a high five button or something like that and it's like if you want to buy a cup of coffee, something like that, you can, you know, donate a dollar or two dollars or something like that. I don't know. It's uh, pretty new still. <laughs>
But yeah, uh, supporting the channel. Hey, I just went to a ZZ concert after the last video. I think this is the fourth, is this the fourth or fifth one in this series? This is the first one where we're really actually starting to do math, where we're actually uh, designing the power supply. Last video, we looked at the amplifier and the simulation to see how much power we needed and why. And some other videos, we talked about the power supply and what we're going to do and things like that. But this is the first video in the actual design process. So I uh, hope you like that. And uh, there, I do have some videos explaining power factor correction. And I can explain that more in, in another video here if you like. Uh, but I'll put the links down below to show you the other, you know, in case you're interested in seeing those other videos that I did on power factor correction, okay? So, hey, I really appreciate you guys. And I'm trying to move along pretty fast in this design, this collaboration with John Audio Tech, so that we can get a power supply design pretty quick, okay? So I'm going to go through the board design and all that kind of stuff. We're going to try to make the boards available to buy, you know, so you guys can just go off and buy your own. Or I'm not sure how that's going to work yet. You know, we'll see how that goes as we as we get that far, okay? There are some channels that get support from, like, PCB companies and that who actually pay them to do videos to show their stuff. I don't get paid by anybody. Uh, the only help I get is through you guys. So uh, I do get meters, and I've, I've been given some nice equipment, some power supplies and stuff. I've been given some really nice equipment, really happy about that. But I just want to let you know that, uh, yeah, I... I don't get paid to do the videos and sponsored or anything like that. And I reach out. So I have PCB companies reaching out to me, asking me if if they can help me. But what they want me to do is just buy, you know, PCBs from them. <laughs> so my I think my channel is still too small to get sponsored by a PCB company. But that would be really cool if I if I could. Um, all right, I'm just rambling on here, so I'm gonna say goodbye. And thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.